All right, welcome back, or at least to another physics lecture. This one is going to be about Newton's first law of motion. And as you can see, I indicated this is now officially sort of the beginning of part one of this course. Uh, the last lecture, the first lecture, uh, was sort of just some background, not necessarily physics, but things that you might might be useful for you to know, right? math and science, so general, generally speaking, about math and science. Right, so now we're going to get into some actual physics, and to begin with, uh, we start out with mechanics, right? So mechanics is another way of saying how do things move, right? How do things uh, go from one place to another? How do they do it when at a constant rate? How do they do it when that rate changes? How do they turn around? Right? All about how objects move. Uh, also sometimes referred to as uh, kinematics. And, well, there's no really ways about it. Uh, Newton is a very well-known physicist, and for a good reason, in that he basically just came up with, uh, or codified at least, the way that things sort of uh, move in what we call Newton's three laws. Three laws of motion. So this first lecture is going to be about the first law. So before we get to the first law, we're going to go through a little bit of uh, background and sort of lead up to uh, Newton. And to begin with, look back at least to the ancient Greek times and uh, to Aristotle, who, you know, you could say was a scientist. He was doing exploration. He I think a lot of people would say he founded a number of different areas in science, like uh, um, biology for one. Um, he was more of a, a philosopher and not necessarily a good scientist. I say that mostly because he didn't really seem to take the idea of testing his theories all that much to heart, right? And being willing to admit when they were wrong. Some of his theories, it seems like if you just tested it, it, which seemed like it would be pretty easy to prove wrong. So it took a few thousand years uh, until Galileo came along and was much more accurate and was doing science, was making theories as hypotheses, was testing those hypotheses and coming up with uh, formulas and using mathematics to describe uh, his theories and the results and make predictions and all that sort of thing. So this is one example where you know, there's that attitude of science, so there's that way science is supposed to be, and there's, then there's also, you know, humans are the way that we are, and you can have somebody who is just so well thought of, like Aristotle, that his ideas were just sort of taken to be true for a very long time. So this was not a very scientific way of going about it, because, like I said, if you would have really dug into and questioned his theories, it wouldn't have been all that difficult to prove something wrong at least for some of what Aristotle was talking about. In particular, thinking about Aristotle's sort of theory of motion, how things move around. So his idea was basically that there are two sort of states of every object, and depending on what the object is made up of, it has this natural tendency to want to do something. It's kind of a lot to describe, but you know, you have things that are made up of, say, like Earth, Earth-like things, right? So this is before we had the ideas about atoms and elements and things like that. So it was the fundamental, uh, the fundamental things were sort of earth and water and wind, right? So if you have something that's earth-like, so like a stone or like, I guess a person or an apple, right? Their natural tendency is to be drawn to the earth, right? So that's why if you release a stone, it falls to the earth, right? This is Aristotle's theory. And he was also part of that theory was that a heavier object, earth-like object, is more strongly attracted to the earth. It, it has a more greater tendency to want to get pulled to the Earth, so it will get pulled faster towards the Earth. So if we were to compare or look at a picture of what Aristotle's theory would say about dropping, say, a ball of wood versus a ball of iron, for Aristotle, the iron is heavier, the same size, iron is much more dense, iron is going to be heavier. If I were to drop them, the iron being heavier means it's going to get pulled more strongly to the Earth. Right? So if you look at these as being like sort of snapshots, drop, 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 the wood's going at a certain rate, the iron's going faster. Well, hopefully you know, uh, but if you didn't know, that is incorrect. The speed, or the rate at which this object speeds up as it falls towards the earth, does not depend on the weight or the mass of that object. 
So in reality, if you were to take those two uh, spheres, or those two balls, and you were to drop them, they'd fall at the same rate. Da, 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 da. This is one area where you would have thought that you take a stone, and maybe a much smaller stone, and you just let it go, and you hit the ground at the same time, uh, maybe Aristotle fell. Yeah, so Aristotle had this idea of motion as sort of being like an unnatural thing. Like, so uh, for an object to be in motion, it's unnatural, so there has to be something that causes that object to stay in motion. So, you know, if we were to look at this picture of like a cannon firing, there weren't cannons back then, but we can uh, ex put, put ex his ideas onto this picture and say, well, his idea would essentially be that there's this sort of unnatural state where the um, cannonball has been pushed out of the cannon, it goes a certain distance, and then it enters its natural state, which is just a fall straight down. Again, this is not how reality works. In reality, the cannonball will shoot out and also drop at the same time. Right? The, that arc was probably a lot further along, unless it's a very weak cannon, but you get the idea, I think. So he had ideas of why things kept going in motion when they weren't being pushed, and it had to do with like the air moving around and moving back in and kind of pushing along still. It was a theory, it was scientific, and the reason it was scientific is it could be proven wrong, and it was proven wrong. These Aristotle's ideas of motion are incorrect. So one of the most famous examples of a scientific experiment, which may or may not have happened, I've heard that it might just be sort of a story rather than an actual thing. Regardless if it did happen or not, it's a good story, so. Well, we'll talk about what Gallo actually did. We know for sure he did might not have actually gone on top of the tower and dropped it. So. But if Galileo had taken these two balls, say like a bowling ball and a basketball, or whatever, two balls, one's much heavier than the other, you take them all the way to the top of the tower, leaning tower of Pisa, and release those balls to the crowd's astonishment, after you release those balls, the heavier and the lighter one fell at the same rate and hit the ground at the same time. So, in that simple instance, you proved that Aristotle's theory of motion is incorrect. You might be wondering, well, why does a feather not seem to fall so quickly, or a piece of paper not seem to fall so quickly? Uh, it turns out that has more to do with the fact that it's falling through something. Even though you don't see the air around you, there's air around us, right? So that air will cause resistance, air resistance, which uh, ends up pushing back against an object that's moving through it. We'll talk more about air resistance in things falling and how that affects it. But in general, if there was no air resistance, then things would fall at the exact same rate. Okay, so that's the sort of story that gets told about Galileo. The thing that Galileo for sure actually did was look at um, objects rolling down uh, inclined planes, right? So planes that are at an angle, put a ball on it and roll it down, and kind of observe how it uh, moves down, uh, how far it moves in each second, say, uh, how fast it's moving, things like that. So if you were to think about the motion of a ball, or like a sphere that's rolling down a hill, if you imagine, well, you put that uh, sphere on a downslope, then the ball is going to roll down it, and it's going to uh, increase its speed as it rolls down. You can watch it, it'll get faster and faster and faster. And if you make it steeper, it's gonna happen even faster, right? It's gonna go, it's gonna, again, it's gonna speed up, but it's gonna go faster and faster, and it's gonna happen quicker. And the other side of that is if you decrease that uh, angle, it's still gonna roll, and it's still gonna increase its speed, it's just gonna go be, that increase is gonna be a bit slower. On the other end, if you try to roll a ball up a hill, right? You try to roll it up, it slows down, um, eventually it'll come to a, a stop. If you try to roll it up a much steeper incline, it'll slow down even quicker, it won't even go as far. If you try to roll it down to less of an incline, right, it'll slow down, but it'll slow down less or slower than it did at the mid middle. So it'll go a bit further, but it'll still slow down actually and stop. So Galileo's idea was that, well, if it's on a, uh, a downslope, it speeds up. If it's on an upslope, it slows down. So ideally, what's right in the middle of speeding up and slowing down? What's in that this horizontal flat surface, right? Well, between speeding down or speeding up and slowing down, 
is not changing your speed at all. So he could uh, hypothesize that if I have an ideal situation, I have a ball rolling along uh, nicely on a flat surface, it shouldn't speed up or slow down, it should continue rolling forever. So this is the beginning of a thinking where the natural state of this object is actually just to continue what it's already doing. This is just kind of an extension of that last slide. Okay? So um, not just imagining a ball just out of nowhere rolling down a hill or, rolling, or a ball rolling up a hill. Um, if we can imagine then, and Galileo could do this uh, as an experiment, was essentially make a kind of track for uh, balls to roll along where you have its startup on one side, it's on this uh, down slope. Um, so it will roll down, it will roll across, and then it's going to roll up the opposite side, right? So then it goes to, uh, uh, uphill on the opposite side. And if you do this, then the ball is going to roll down, it's going to roll across, it's going to roll up, and it's going to stop. And it stops essentially at the exact same height that you started out at, right? So you let it go at this height, it goes down, it goes up, down, across, up, back to the same height, and then it's going to probably roll back down. Well, so if you then take the uh, opposite slope, that uphill slope, and you decrease the incline a little bit, right? So you make it a shallower uh, uphill climb, then still, as is shown in the picture here, you release that ball, it's going to go down, it's going to go across, it's going to roll up, and it still wants to roll up to the exact same height that you let it go at. But now that that uh, uphill has been angled down, it needs to go further before it can reach that same height again. Right? So uh, the second picture versus the first one here, the balls uh, roll across and they roll up to this final height, the same height that they started at, in that final position, but since we have this less of an incline here, it has to roll further out. And again, Galilei imagine this and theorize or hypothesize that, well, the ideal sort of situation is that if I keep, and I imagine I keep decreasing that uh, uphill slope, right? So keep bringing down this uh, incline side. Well, every time you decrease that slope, it's got to go further and further away in order to reach that initial height again, right? Because it wants to come, come down, then come back up to the same height that it started, right? So if you're taking that slope down further and further and further, it's got to go further and further out until it reaches that same height. And the extreme of that is that if I have a flat surface, no incline, it's never going to reach that initial height that it started at, because it never comes back up. So again, it should continue on forever. So all of this, these uh, experiments and sort of hypotheses and so to the ideal situation are questioning uh, still Aristotle's idea that this natural state of things should just fall and stop. I should probably say something about friction at this point, because you might be thinking to yourself, well, if I roll a ball down a hill, it doesn't keep going forever. I don't care how flat the surface is at the end of the hill. And you would be correct. That is because there is actually something that is acting on the ball. There's something that's trying to change the motion of the ball. Instead of it continuing to roll on forever, there's actually a force that's acting on it, and that force is a frictional force. And also a little bit of the air resistance, too, uh, as the ball runs into the air in front of it. So we're going to talk more about uh, friction and air resistance, if not in the next lecture, then the lecture after that, so not too much about it now. But just to say that friction is something that always acts against the motion of an object. So for instance, when you slide along on a, a floor, friction is pushing back on you against the direction you're going to try to slow you down and eventually stop you. Or if you jump out of an airplane, another kind of friction, air resistance, uh, will stop you from speeding up indefinitely. You'll jump out, you'll speed up to a certain velocity, which is what's known as your terminal velocity, and then you won't keep speeding up anymore. Right? So in the case of the ball rolling down the hill, the ball does roll down the hill, and if there were no friction or air resistance, the ball would continue to roll off forever. And we can actually do those kinds of experiments in uh, free fall situations or in very microgravity uh, situations with very low gravity um, or even surfaces that are just very, very smooth. But yeah, so that's kind of, sort of why I maybe kept qualifying his ideas when Galileo was talking about these um, experiments. You could imagine the ideal situation where there isn't any friction, there isn't any air resistance. In that situation, the ball would just continue to roll forever.
So in talking about fi friction, uh, I explained or said friction is a force, and I've used the word force, I think, before. And since we're almost at the point where we're going to state Newton's first law, we need to understand what a force is, what I mean, at least at some level by a force, because Newton's first law involves the, that word. At a very basic sort of level, a force is just something uh, that pushes or pulls on an object or a thing. So if I push against a chair, then I'm just acting a force on that chair, right? The force is that push. Or if I, uh, you know, tug on the chair or something, or I tug on a rope, then I'm acting a force on that rope, but I'm pulling on that rope. So remember uh, this idea of a vector, that a vector is something that has a length or a magnitude and a direction to it. Right? So force is what we would call a vector quantity, meaning that to describe a force, I need to say how much force I'm pushing, or the amount of force I'm pushing with, and in what direction I'm pushing. So when I say I push on a chair, right, I can say, well, I have to, I can describe maybe I'm pushing with, say, 50 newtons of force, and I'm pushing, um, well, away from me. Direction's a little bit arbitrary, depending on your perspective. I think maybe this is to the left for you. But the amount and the direction is what comes into uh, describing a force. And we'll talk a good bit more about forces for Newton's second law. Um, but we do know this uh, concept for Newton's first law as well. So another uh, basic, or not necessarily basic, but uh, fundamental concept for Newton's first law is this idea of inertia. Okay. So inertia is it's not a vector, it's just uh, basically a property of matter. And when I say matter, I mean things that have mass, they're made up of atoms and things like that. So it's a property of matter to resist changes in motion. So if something's moving, it doesn't want to uh, stop moving. If something's not moving, it doesn't want to start. So the amount of inertia you would say that an object has, well, it depends on the amount of matter, how many atoms make it up. Yeah, it's technically, you, you could say the inertia is proportional to the mass of the object, or the amount of matter that makes it up. Okay, so force and inertia. Mm -hmm. Here we go for Newton's first law of motion. An object at rest will remain at rest, and an object that is in motion will remain in motion, in uniform motion, meaning motion in a straight line with a constant speed, unless a force acts on that object. This is at least one way of stating Newton's first law. It's one of the more common ones. You say an object is at rest. If an object is at rest, it will remain at rest. If it's in motion, in uniform motion, it will remain in uniform motion unless acted on by an outside force. It's easiest to think about these uh, things in the ideal situation, so maybe um, imagine watching an astronaut in the uh, International Space Station, and they sort of take an object, whatever it is, maybe an orange or something, and push it, it'll start to move along, right? So it's moving along at this constant speed in a straight line, so this is uniform motion, and it's gonna keep doing that unless another force comes along to change that motion. Another force maybe being that uh, it's the wall, the wall exerts a force back on it to stop it from going that direction. Or maybe somebody grabs it and exerts a force backwards to slow it down and then stop it and hold it. Right? The other example, or the other side of that is that if it's, you just let, uh, say, that orange go, then it's going to float in uh, space, it's going to float in the same location, meaning it's just at rest, it's not moving, relative to you at least, and it's going to remain that way unless something comes along and acts a force on it to change that. Right? So that would be then somebody coming along and pushing on that orange and then starting to move. So one way to think about Newton's first law is essentially it's just a statement about inertia, about objects that are massive have inertia. That all boils down to any object with mass will resist a change in its motion, in the way that it's moving. If it's not moving at all, it doesn't want to change that. If it's moving already, it's moving in a straight line, it doesn't want to change that either. Newton's first law, you know, it could be thought about in this sort of implication way, like the hit land sort of statement, um, and these statements go in both directions. Right? So if you start out with an object and it's at rest, and it's not moving, that means, that will tell you, or it implies, there's no force acting on that object. And before I move on and talk about forces still here, I should note that um, 
Newton's first law technically is about not just any single force, it's the essentially all of the forces together that act on an object. If you look at all, the sum of all of them, how they all sometimes they push against each other, sometimes they push with each other, sometimes they pull against each other, right? You look at the sum of all those, we call that the net force. And if there's no net force on that object, so if all the forces cancel each other out in some way, right, you push this much to the left, you push this much to the right, you push the same amount, then there's no net force. There's going to be no um, net push or pull on that object, right? So technically Newton's first law is about net force. If there's no net force on an object. So again, if an object is at rest, you can infer that there's no net force acting on that object, or net forces, or all the forces sum up to zero, so now they cancel each other out. Um, also, if an object is in uniform motion, meaning it's traveling in a straight line at a constant speed, you can infer then that it also, in that case, there's no net forces acting on that object. And again, these statements go the other, go both ways. If you somehow you know there's no net force on an object, you can infer that object is either at rest or in uniform motion. Okay, think about a little example and uh, watch a video that's kind of related to this or similar to it. But an example of Newton's first law and in inertia in general is if you take some uh, like some carts and you know these carts are going to be on wheels and um, if you stack say a few of them on top of each other and kind of push them all together so get them all going. Okay? So they're all moving at this constant rate um, assuming the very little friction or whatnot then there's, or air resistance and they're just going to continue going at a, nice constant uniform motion, right? So they're all moving together in this uniform motion and they want to continue to do that. So they're going to continue to do that unless something acts on them, some outside force acts on them, some net force acts on them to stop them. Right? In this picture, the carts are different sizes. So when they encounter the wall, the first one encounters the wall, this large one encounters the wall first. So bam, there's a force on that bottom cart and it acts against the motion in order to stop it. Right. However, there's no force that's been acted on the top two parts still, so uh, Newton's first law and the property of inertia says that they're going to continue moving in that uniform motion until a force acts on them. So the next thing that would happen would be that that second part would hit the wall, the wall would impart an uh, active force on it to stop it. Right. Then the third one would keep going until finally it hit the wall and it stop too, or they might bounce back. Okay, so let's see maybe a video of that happening. So it's slightly different because it's actually it's a stack of uh, books on a chair and a little, uh, right? But the, all these things are in uniform motion. The chair, the slot rolling chair hits the other chair. So the chair, the rolling chair, has had a force that acted on it, so it would actually change uh, its motion, right? It was in this nice uniform motion coming towards the other one. And the second chair was there, so it ran into it, it acted a force on it, it changed its motion, right? But what you saw was that the books, they didn't hit anything right away, and the stuff uh, doll here didn't hit anything either. So they wanted to continue going in that same direction. And they did continue until they hit the wall after the chair. Maybe another interesting uh, demonstration of Newton's first law and inertia is if you take a stack of uh, washers, it's metal discs, you can do something interesting or you can see inertia sort of in action if you are able to basically hit uh, one of those discs individually. So the washers are all massive, they're all made up of uh, matter. Right? So they all have inertia, and they all don't want to change from their current state, which if you just stack them here, the current state, you would say it was, they're just at rest. They're sitting there at rest, right? Yeah, let's see what happens. So we have that stack of washers, and what he's going to do is he has a ruler, I think, of some kind, or something flat, hard uh, object here, and so that he can actually uh, act a force on one of those washers at a time, say like the bottom washer, right? So if he uses that ruler to smack the bottom washer, then you're acting a force on it. So Newton's first law says, well, you're going to change its motion. You're actually going to cause it to move to the side, right, in the direction that force was acting. 
But the rest of the washers, you, there, you didn't act a force on those, so they're not going to want to move, right? No force, it's going to want to remain at rest. There you can just slice, slice the washers out from underneath, and the runs on top just want to see where they are. I guess he's probably practiced this, it seems pretty good at it. So there you go, the inertia of these objects means that they don't want to change from their at rest position, so only the ones that are getting hit you're actually acting the force on are uh, you're going to cause to move. The rest of them stay at rest. To say that there is a little bit of, you might be thinking there is a little bit of a force because when you hit one of the washers, the contact of that washer to the washer above it, there's a little bit of friction in between there. So there's a little bit of force, but not enough to actually get any of those other washers. Okay, so one other example of inertia would be if you've ever uh, yanked on the toilet paper roll, you might have noticed that other things, all other things being equal, if the toilet paper roll is almost empty and you try to yank down on the uh, end, then you are just going to quickly unwind the toilet paper roll, right? You're going to pull the rest of it out. And that is supposed to, if that toilet paper roll still is basically full and you yank down on that, then you're probably just going to rip off whatever part you were yanking down on. This is another example of inertia because when the uh, toilet paper roll is almost empty, then it has less mass, right? So remember the inertia of an object, it's uh, that property that resists changing its motion or its state of motion, depends on how massive it is, how much matter makes it up. So with that nearly empty uh, roll, there's not a whole lot of mass there, it has less inertia. Versus the larger roll, more mass there, more inertia. So the smaller one, the almost empty one, um, essentially has less of an ability to resist a change in its motion. So when you go to yank on it, it doesn't have that much inertia, so it just starts to roll around. You, you change its motion from being at rest to rolling around there. Versus the bigger roll, it has more inertia, so you pull it at rest, or you try to yank on it, it has enough inertia to resist that change in motion, so the whole roll stays at rest, and you just yank off the piece. All right, and you can imagine another example of inertia, well, related to some historical stuff, I guess, where um, the idea of inertia or the tendency of an object to remain at rest or in uniform motion uh, was probably around for a while, but was kind of dismissed for a long time. And one of the reasons was that, say, when Copernicus uh, proposed the Earth was actually moving around the sun, not the sun moving around the Earth, uh, people thought it was just ridiculous that the Earth is moving at all, because if it was, how would uh, something like a bird jump, drop off of a, a tree branch be able to swoop down and grab a worm? Okay. So the thought was that, well, if the Earth is moving and the bird leaves the tree branch, then the Earth is going to be moving, and the bird's going to totally, it's going to get sort of passed by the, by the Earth, and it will miss that worm entirely. Right? So the bird jumps off, the earth keeps going, and the, the bird's out of luck. Right? However, the idea of inertia means that even though the earth is moving, the bird's also moving too. So it's already in a state of motion along with the earth. So to say when the bird jumps off the branch and goes down, the bird's already moving in this uh, motion along with the earth. So even though the earth keeps rotating around and also moving around the sun, the bird's also doing that. So by jumping off the branch, it doesn't lose that motion, it just adds on some extra motion of it going down uh, to pick up the worm and coming back up. A little question for you, uh, the first of probably many in this course, and I'd like you to take these as questions where you, well, maybe you know the answer right away. If you don't, then hit pause before I switch to the next uh, slide and show you the answer, and try to well, think about it on your own. Select, if it's a multiple choice one, say which, write down which answer you think it is. If it's not multiple choice, write out your answer, whatever you think it is. And then unpause the video and look at the explanation. Hopefully you're correct, but if you were not correct, then that's totally fine too. I just hope that you understand then why you weren't correct, and so maybe you'll be more understanding of the concept. Okay, so in this question, you're imagining that you're riding along at a steady speed um, in maybe a train or a plane, doesn't quite matter what, um, but you have a coin 
and you toss that coin up in the air, right? remember you're moving along at this steady rate, where is that coin going to land? A, B, C, or D. Right? So take a minute. Think about it. Okay, well, hopefully you said C, that the coin will just land in your hand. And it will do that for the same reason that the bird can swoop down and get the uh, worm without the worm and the earth whizzing away from the bird. Right? So when you flip up a coin in the air, the coin, before you flipped it, and even went after you flipped it, it already is in this uniform motion along with you and the train or the plane, whatever uh, vehicle is taking you along. Right? So it already has this uniform motion going forward, and when you flip it up in the air, you're adding this sort of upward motion, but you don't actually change that uh, horizontal motion. So that's why when you flip that coin up, it goes up, and it just comes right back down, from your perspective. In fact, you're talking about just forces, and particularly when there's more than one force acting on an object. So, you know, like when you're pushing on a table one way and somebody doesn't want you to push on it, so they push on it the other way, right? You're both acting forces on that table and you're opposing forces. So the net force on that object or the total amount of force on that object is going to essentially be the difference between the pushes or the forces that you're each exerting. So this idea of summing up forces, or looking at all the forces that are on an object, and kind of summing them up, involves looking at how much force, or the magnitude of each force that's being exerted, and in what direction that force is being exerted. So looking at force, again, is a full vector quantity. So as an example, if you imagine that there's like a brick sitting on a table or a surface of some kind, and maybe you uh, take your right hand and you push along that brick a little bit, you push with three newtons of force then I guess you're going the other direction. Push three units of force here, right? Someone else comes along and they push with a bit more force in the same direction, right? So maybe they push with five units of force, right? Same direction though. So this idea of a net force or a total force is to say that those two forces, since they're in the same direction, are going to essentially just add together to be the same as or equivalent to an eight newton force pushing in that same direction. So the Newton is a unit of force, it's the way we uh, measure an amount of force, at least in the metric system. In the um, standard or whatever, the units we use here in America, they uh, are pounds. A pound is a measurement of force. And a Newton is actually just about a fifth of a pound. So five Newtons is about one pound of force that you're pushing. So, that other example was if you have, say, two forces that are pushing in the same direction, they can add together. If you have two forces that are pushing in the opposite direction, they're going to cancel each other out, right? They're acting against each other, so uh, the difference of those forces is essentially what is going to be the net force in the end. So if you have that same brick, and I'm pushing still with three newtons to begin with, um, on the left of that brick, somebody else comes along and pushes with three newtons on the right of that brick, well, three newtons to the left plus three newtons to the right, overall, zero force acting on that object, zero net force acting on that object. Right? So this is to say that the sum of all those forces adds up to being just zero. If instead I push with three newtons to the left and the, somebody else comes along and pushes with five newtons to the right, well, that's not going to be zero net force overall now, right? Because the difference is going to be, well, three newtons to the left, five newtons to the right, is actually two newtons to the right, and the object's actually going to end up moving move to the right, probably. So sometimes you say if there's, you know, all there's a bunch of forces acting on an object, but they all cancel each other out, um, they all balance out to be a zero net force on that object, you might say that, you know, they balance each other out, or there's no net force on that object. All right, so another... Uh, sort of question or uh, check yourself time, see how well this is sinking in. If you have uh, these sort of three pictures on the left and they're showing that there's two forces acting on a block of something, whatever it might be, if those are the actual forces acting, what is the net effect of those forces? What's the total force that's acting on that object? So I'd like you to, again, uh, hit pause and try to draw the force acting on, uh, say, the net force, the total force acting on, say, this first object, and we're drawing it as a vector like these other ones are drawn. So um, an arrow 
and also indicate the amount of that force. Right? So like in this top picture, there's two forces acting on it, both to the right, first to the left, I, sorry, you know, both in the same direction and they're both five newtons. Right? So those are that's how we indicate a force. So I want you to be able to draw one arrow that indicates the total force on that object, right? And in these three situations. All right. So hopefully you took a stab at that and came up with something like these. And if not, again, if that's fine. It's better that you try, and then you're more likely to realize why you might have been wrong and remember it better later. So if you have two forces acting in the same direction, those forces are just going to add together. Two five newton forces acting in the same direction is equivalent to a net force of ten newtons in that same direction. In the second case, a five newton force to the left and a five newton force to the right, uh, since they're in opposite directions, it's the difference of them that's the net force, meaning zero newtons in this case, because they're the same amount of force. The magnitudes are the same. And finally, the situation where you have a ten newton force to one side and a five newton force to the other side, well, again, they're acting in opposite directions, so the sum or the difference of them is going to tell you what the net force is. Difference being five newtons, and of course, the larger force wins out, so the net is five newtons that way. So. Okay. All right, one more question for now. Say you have a cart and it's pulled to the right with a force of 15 newtons. Well, it's also being pulled to the left with a force of 21 newtons. What is the net force acting on this cart? So go ahead and pause and give yourself an answer. All right, hopefully you said five newtons to the left. So again, these are forces. They're acting in opposite directions, once to the right, once to the left. So the net force is the difference of them. And the direction of that is going to be in the direction of the larger force, essentially. The larger force wins out. So another sort of interesting example of net forces, and how if you have an object that's uh, at rest, or in uniform motion, constant speed is a straight line, then the net force on that object is zero. Right? That's just Newton's first law. So keep that in mind, and now, if we think of this situation where we have, say, uh, this stick, and it's suspended between these two scales. Right? So you're holding these two scales, and the scales are just showing how much force the, um, the stick is pulling down on each of those uh, scales. If we also hang a mass, something like an iron weight or something, um, off of that stick, then in total, the stick, since it has a weight, or that, the amount that it's pulling down, is going to be 2 newtons, and the iron mass is, a ten, is 10 newtons, then in total, there's 12 newtons that are kind of pulling downward right there, the stick and the mass together. What that means is if I have these two scales holding it up, the sum of what those scales is going to show needs to also be 12 newtons. Because right? if there's 12 newtons getting pulled down, there needs to also be 12 newtons getting pulled back up in order for this whole situation to be at rest. Right? The net force uh, here needs to be zero. So in the situation shown here, we have that iron mass at one place, one position. It's a little bit more to the um, right side. So the scale on the right is going to show 7 newtons, and the scale on the left shows 5 newtons, right? But in total, that's still the 12 newtons out here. That's the same amount of force pulling down is getting kind of pulled back up here. If I were to shift that iron mass over even more, then this scale on, on the right here it's going to show more newtons, right? It's going to be pulled down even more on this right-hand side. So maybe it goes up to 10 newtons, right? So if the scale on the right shows 10 newtons, how many newtons need to be shown on the scale on the left? Well, hopefully, you say two, right? Because again, in total, the net force on this in this kind of situation is zero. So if there's 12 newtons pulling down, i got to show whatever newtons I'm showing on the one scale, it's got to... Uh, add up with the other scale to be 12. So if I then shifted this guy maybe all the way to the one side, then this scale basically reads 12, that scale is going to show zero. Or if I shifted the um, ma iron mass right to the center, well, it probably should be evenly balanced, so this scale would show 6, that scale would show 6. 
So exercising this idea of net forces. Okay, so one other force we'll talk about in this lecture is what's called, sometimes called the support force, also called the normal force. The support force is a broad term for the force that any surface exerts on an object when you place an object on the surface. So in this case, or the picture shown here, we have like this gold uh, brick and it's placed on a tabletop, right? The tabletop is actually exerting a force on that brick in order to stop it from essentially pushing through the table or crushing the table. So that's why we call it, it's sometimes called a support force because you're sort of, uh, it's the force that supports an object on the surface, right? So if the brick is, uh, weighs a hundred newtons, meaning there's a hundred, there's a hundred newtons of force that's pulling it down, then the support force from that table also needs to be 100 newtons pushing in the opposite direction, pushing upward. Right? And the reason is that that brick is at rest. Right? That brick's not moving. So Newton's first law says if it's not moving, the net force on that brick needs to be zero. However, that brick, if we just think about it by itself, right? there's a force pulling it down. We haven't gotten into it much, but that's the force of gravity. Right? So gravity is pulling it down. In order for it not to start moving, there needs to be another force on it pushing it up, right? That's the support force. You put it on that, that up, the gold brick on that table, gravity is still pulling it down. It still has that 100 newtons pulling it down, but the support force is balancing it out. So in total, the net force on this uh, brick is zero, meaning it can be just at rest, right? Newton's first law, net force on an object is zero. It's either at rest or in uniform motion. This case is at rest. That's a question I kind of already answered here, so. Yeah, so like I said, that support force is a force that always um, sort of opposes an object kind of crushing or pushing through a surface, right? So another example is like a book on a table. That book has a certain amount of weight, which means gravity is pulling it down with a certain amount of uh, force. And that force, so that the book doesn't just push through the table, that force is balanced or is opposed by this support force from the table pushing it up. So you have the force of gravity pulling it down, you have the support force pushing it up. In total, there's no net force because uh, the support force just balances out that uh, force of gravity. Yeah, so it doesn't. the support force doesn't need to just be on a flat surface, right? If I, if I lean against this wall, there's also a support force from this wall onto my fist to stop my fist from pushing through the wall, right? So anytime you have an object and it's sort of resting or um, yeah, resting on a surface, but not pushing the surface, not moving that surface at all. There's generally a support force that's stopping uh, that movement. So if, even if I, you know, even if I push into this wall, I'm exerting a force on the wall, but the wall's not going anywhere because it's exerting its normal force back out of my. Uh, sorry, normal force, support force. So this is the same. One way to think about the support force is essentially like when you push down on a surface, or when, like, when I push into this wall. It's almost like I, I sort of start to compress the atoms that make up that wall a little bit, and the atoms then act sort of like a spring, where when you compress them, uh, it gets sort of more and more difficult to compress it more, and eventually you just can't compress it anymore. So by pushing against the wall, it's sort of like I'm pushing a, squeezing a spring together, and eventually, pretty quickly, that spring just stops me from continuing to move. So that's where you get this sort of idea, where the normal force you, know, you can kind of think of it as being like trying to push a spring down or something. And I guess it's even uh, more useful in the analogy because a spring is something that generally if you if you imagine pushing against a spring or trying to compress a spring, that spring pushes back. Right? So this is the idea behind, or part of the idea behind the normal force. It's a force where you try to push against something, it always pushes back. That's the support force. Um, right, so that's the end of lecture two. I believe, on Newton's uh, first law of motion. Next time, we're going to take a short break from Newton's laws and talk a bit about linear motion or motion in a line. All right, so uh, be well, and I'll see you later.